You know, the, um, it's a funny thing about communication because um, uh, when you have a great message to give, sometimes it doesn't get heard right, and sometimes uh, you're heard really clearly, but you don't have much of a message to give. You know, it's always very confusing. <laughs> and uh, uh, for several years, I was a, a preaching professor at Fuller Seminary and uh, the homiletics classes, and uh, um, it was a, a, a it was exciting to see a new generation of preachers, but there, there was always that dynamic where somebody would work on their sermon and they would write it out word for word and they'd get their, you know, pages of it and then they'd get up to deliver it and they would read it to us. And they'd never look up and they'd read it to us. And I thought, wow, they're communicating something beyond what their words are. And they, the word, nothing wrong with words. Then we always would have one or two people in the classes who were really brilliant communicators and they'd have, we were on the edge of our seats, they were interesting and all those things and then I realized there was no message. <laughs> there was nothing there. And uh, it, it was an interesting thing to see. And so um, I realized when, when we first started here uh, almost, almost three years ago and we'd set up some chairs, remember we had tables, we had like 10 or 12 tables in here and uh, to make it look full when there were only 20 people. But, um, <laughs> We're down to two now. <laughs> but um, I wanted the chairs right up front. And I wanted to put the tables right up here like a little cafe, you know. And, uh, and I was really excited about that because we get everybody close. And then Baron, my on-site wizard, uh, <laughs> says, John, you cannot do this. This would be the worst thing you could do. And I go, Baron, what are you talking about? People want to be near me, you know. <laughs> and he went, no, you absolutely cannot do this. Move the tables back, move the chairs back. I go, why? He said, because from where we're sitting, it looks like you're glaring at us and you're yelling at us. <laughs> so we have to be back away. Isn't that true? <laughs> it really did. And, uh, I went, well, who would think, you know, and so I thought, wow, you know, okay. So we have this fake row in the front <laughs> that nobody actually sits in. And, uh, and we always start filling in from the back so it, so it doesn't look like I'm wearing. And I realized there's something very powerful in what we say that sometimes our expressions or the way we say it uh, totally change the message, right? And and I, I, uh, I've talked about this before. Um, you know, the, I, I could be, um, you know, I wanted to express to you how much I love you. And, and I've been thinking a lot about this, and, and I've been thinking, you know, that really, uh, I, I can't imagine another group of people that I care more for. And, and I, I just want you to know that, um, you know, my, my respect for you it knows no bounds, really. And, uh, and I just want, so anyway, I don't know why you're laughing because I'm sharing sincerely from my heart and every word I said was true, right? And then you went, yeah, but there's another message here, right? Well, our uh, sermon series has been uh, the five choices that shape our lives, right? And today, I want us to look at uh, a choice that we have that may be the most important choice. But it comes to us in two parts. And so I want you to pay attention uh, to our scripture in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say I am? And they reply, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or some of them just think you're one of the prophets. And then he asks, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? So Lord, teach us from this passage. Teach us of what you would have us know and, and give us courage to act on, on your word. Amen. So this is an amazing passage because um, Jesus is basically taking a Gallup poll, you know, 
What do, who do people say that I am? What do they, they've seen ministry, they've seen what's happened, they've seen miracles, they've heard me teach, they've done all of these things, you know, Sermon on the Mount, all those things. Who do they say I am? And then the disciples had all these different answers. Well, it could be John the Baptist, he was really famous and everything, or you could be you know, prophet, you know, or maybe you're just kind of some prophet out there, I don't know, you know, maybe you're obviously something, you know. Uh, you're one of the prophets, you know. And then Jesus turns it and, and asks this question that leads us to our choice, and that is, but who do you say I am? And the one I want you to focus on, but what about you? Isn't that a great response? Who do people say that I am? Blah, 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 blah. But what about you? Who do you think? Who do you say that I am? And, and uh, that gets us to this choice in which we're confronted with the, the Christ, the living Lord, coming to us and saying, okay, what about you? What about you? And who do you say I am? And uh, this may be the most important uh, question that uh, that's God's ever asked us because it gets right down to the point that it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, it doesn't matter what anybody else believes, it doesn't matter what we've been taught, it doesn't matter uh, what church we go to or don't go to, it doesn't matter what our friends or family think, it doesn't matter our spiritual heritage, you know, if we have uncles or aunts who were pastors or whether we're a pagan family like I was in, and uh, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because Jesus is asking, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And uh, now, once we hear that question, what about you, then we have to hear the second part is, who do you say that I am? And I've been thinking about that in terms of the communication issue. Because I worked for a long time uh, as a pastor to make sure that I had the right uh, theology you know, I spent, I was at, I don't know, 15 years in seminary, it seemed like forever. <laughs> and uh, grad school, master's, doctorate, all those things, and then teaching, and I was just, never could get out of school. And uh, trying to hone this perfect theology. And, uh, and so this week, I was thinking about that, and uh, I realized that when I started out, I was kind of a, a hippie, you know, and I was, it was in the hippie times back in history, you know, and so historical hippie times. And, uh, and that was influencing me and shaping my theology. And I remember when I was being interviewed uh, uh, before I went off to seminary and an old pastor was supposed to meet with me behind his desk and ask me questions to hear my testimony and make sure that I was okay. Right? So he comes in, we sit down, we banter a little bit, and then he says, okay, I've got to get down to this. John, who is Jesus to you? All that I can remember was the Doobie Brothers song, Jesus is just all right with me. Jesus is just all right. You know, that was kind of going through my head, you know? And I said, well, that's a really good question. Jesus is just all right. So I said, Jesus is my friend. And his face dropped. He was so disappointed. And he said, that's it? <laughs> Well, he's just all right with me, you know, but yeah, he's my friend. I think that pretty well sums it all up. And no kidding, this, this old pastor went, what about, he's the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He was with God in the beginning and was God. He is the light of the world. He is the high priest who after making an atoning sacrifice for our sin, he sits down in completion of the task of saving global humanity. Yeah, what, what you said, yeah. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> And I really thought to myself, yeah, 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 I, I, I got that, I believe that. But you asked me who Jesus was to me. My answer didn't work. So, um, I almost missed being a minister by that. <laughs> but I thought about it this, this week, I was thinking about that experience, and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe my, my answer was okay. Maybe it was okay. 
for where I was or who I was at that time. And, um, and I realize now that basically everything he said was in that Christology 101 class anyway. It was just the outline of the course. So he was just giving me that. But, um, but there's a big difference between what our beliefs are and what we say and what we share. And, and this is important because you can have all your beliefs lined up and share something very different. And uh, I think that our beliefs inform our testimony, right? What we believe comes out in what we say and do. But, and this is really important, what we say and do also ends up shaping our beliefs, ultimately. It comes back around on both sides. So when Jesus says, what about you? You could give your statement of beliefs, but then he says, who do you say that I am? How do you express and verbalize to the people around you what you believe about who I am? And that's a whole other issue, right? Uh, I've, I've got this thing where I've always longed for Christians to be in the news, and not the religion page, okay? I get that. That's boring. But the... Um, to really be in the news and what Christians are saying and doing. And this week, no kidding, you know, I get my news on Yahoo, but um, of course my dad used to say Yahoo. <laughs> he never got that right. But um, on Yahoo, and I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, the very headline of Yahoo's front page had a big headline about a Christian making a statement. And I was so excited to hear the big, wow, what's the chances of a Christian getting I was a pastor, was getting their statement on the front page of Yahoo. So millions of people all over the world were going to hear this testimony. And, and so I printed it up so I didn't want to miss it. It was so. Person claiming to be pastor leaves waiter note, I give God 10%. Why do you get 18? <laughs> Well, I didn't either, so I went further in the story. I clicked on it. Person claiming to be a pastor leaves a waiter note. I give God 10%. So a person claiming to be a pastor apparently tried to stiff the waiter on a tip, explaining that their work for God absolved them from having to leave one. Now that's a statement, isn't it? A photo of the receipt, which is here, uh, shows the bill for $34.93 that included an automatic 18% gratuity of $6.29 above a blank space for an additional tip because they'd been part of a group of 20, so the restaurant automatically put the 18% on when you're in a group of 20 or more, or however many. He says, the diner wrote on the receipt, I give God 10%, and then scratched out the automatic tip that was on the receipt, wrote, why do you get 18, and then they sign their name pastor and put a big zero uh, where the tip was supposed to be. Finally, the Christians are getting in the news. Finally, there's going to be hundreds of millions of people tuning in to get this statement from a Christian, from the pastor. What a great chance for the gospel to go out. And he stiffed them. That was the mess. Now what, okay, what does that say about Jesus? What do you say, who do you say I am by that act? Jesus is a, a tightwad. He's not just all right with me. He's a tightwad and he doesn't care about the uh, working poor. And uh, he's really self-righteous because Jesus wants to, you know, let you know that he is a tither, not just bringing an offering. He's a tither, he does his 10%. And that frees him from being a generous, loving, caring person that the most pagan people in the world don't even think about. <clears throat> Dang, that was our representative. That was our chance. That was a chance that doesn't come along very often. And I think that pastor blew it. Um, if it was one of you, I'm sorry, but I'm not really. But um, 
Anyway, I look at that and I go, wow, what they said there and that testimony that went out across the whole world on the front page of Yahoo, how do you think people responded to it who, who might not be in the kingdom yet, who might not be followers of Jesus? How would they respond to it? Were they surprised? No! Oh yeah, here it is again, another Christian stiff in the poor waiter. Yeah, because they're self-righteous. More damage was done to the kingdom of God in that little act than I could possibly imagine. Right? So, who do people think Jesus is? It's When we share that, it's based on our communication, whether it's verbal, whether it's the words we say, or whether it's our actions or lack of actions, right? That's all goes out in terms of what people are going to, uh, who people are going to think Jesus is from looking at us. Now Jesus says, the way that people are going to know that you're my disciples is what? That you give 10% and stiff the waitress? No. Your love for one another. That's the identifying mark. That's the, the mark. The greatest witness we can do to tell who Jesus is is what he said himself. They're going to know that you're my follower because of your love for each other. When you act loving, they'll know that you're my follower. Now, I understand that uh, we can't just get dismissed on thinking about how we communicate things because what we communicate is important. And the choice that Jesus gives us when he says, what about you? What about you? I think he wants us to really seriously consider who is he to us? Is it more than just uh, religious phrases and ideas and, and Christological, theological uh, I, uh, concepts? Is it, is it personal when we talk about having a relationship with Christ? Uh, you all know the, the, the overused C.S. Lewis quote, but I, I overuse it because <laughs> it's just so darn good. I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Then C.S. Lewis says this, that's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil from hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Who is Jesus to you? I think we have a choice to make. And I think that choice is going to shape our lives. I think my life was shaped when I went from being missionary kid, Sunday school kid, in a pagan family, to, I actually felt like one day in college, I had a little conversation with God. And some of you know this, uh, I don't have very many conversations with God where I feel like it's really clear, but he said, you know, um, I was mad and I said, you know, I'm just not gonna be a Christian because my parents are Christians and there's the church I go to is putting a lot of pressure on me. and. Um, Campus Crusade for Christ is strangling me here, and you know all these different things, and I just I can't I can't follow you, Lord, because of the family and Crusade and friends and church and anything and books I'm I can't I can't do it anymore. And then it was like I heard him say to me, "What are you going to do about me? Forget church, family, friends, school, clubs, and books and everything. What are you going to do about me?" And I was faced with going, yeah, I guess I've got to decide. Am I going to trust you? Or am I going to slink around like I usually do, finding my way evasively through life? Or am I going to trust you? 
I haven't had very many conversations with him after that. Because every time I wanted to re-engage him and have that conversation, you know what he said? You said you were going to trust me. So do it. Is it that simple? Yep. Trust me. Yeah, but what about you? No, what about? Trust me. And, and so literally making that decision when I was a college student changed my life. I was talking to somebody, uh, or not talking with them, but they, they emailed me. Uh, they'd gotten a hold of the Getting Past What You'll Never Get Over book and had read it and emailed me from somewhere in Arkansas or something. And they, they said, how could you and your family go through all these terrible things like this and you're still believing in Jesus? <laughs> I thought about it and went, Wow, I never thought Jesus put our family through all that stuff. Amen. You know, friends betray, uh, things happen, all this, I, I, all that. I never thought Jesus was doing it to me because he's my friend. That's it. Another thing C.S. Lewis said that I found really intriguing is he said, if, if Christianity is not true, it doesn't matter. But if it is true, it matters greatly. Think about that. Jesus said, what, do you, what about you? What are you going to do with me? Who do you say that I am? That's something that only you can answer.